climate change. This is a photograph I took in 2012 in the Gobi Altai of Mongolia. I was privileged to be part of a derecho storm. This is very strong straight winds. Storms like this in the northern hemisphere typically swirl around and are called tornadoes. This is typical weather for that part of the world. But those of you who've been here for a couple of weeks will have just experienced one of these here in person. That's global climate change. When Mongolian weather is in Hungary, that's climate change. Okay. A couple of inconvenient truths today. Well, Stop one is that I'm too many chairs. <laughs> That's all right. It's okay. Um, first of all, climate change unites humanity in a way it has never been united before. How can that be? Well, there are two reasons that that happens. The first is that climate change is a national security issue for every country. And if it's a security issue for every country, it's a security issue for the entire planet. But the other reason that climate change unites humanity is because climate change is literally beyond belief. There is no human belief system on this planet that is privileged, that has escaped from the effects of climate change. There are no religions that are given favor. There are no political systems, there are no economic systems, there are no geographic, artificial geographic boundaries called countries. So it literally, climate change is literally, as far as we're concerned, is beyond belief. And therefore, we're all in this same thing together. And I'm going to talk about some of the science of climate change because as some of you may have seen this meme, this very common meme now, especially in the United States, because finding stuff out is better than making shit up. Or as the last legitimate president of the United States said, don't do stupid shit. It's not how it was reported. It's reported that he said, don't do stupid stuff, but that's not what he actually said. Now, humanity has ignored science since 1896. When Svante Arrhenius, the Swedish physical chemist, published an article saying, you know, if we keep pumping carbon dioxide from industry into the atmosphere, by 2100, we will have heated the atmosphere three degrees Celsius. He said that in 1896. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he also said, this will be a good thing because we'll be able to grow crops longer to feed the massive increasing population that we need to fuel the Industrial Revolution. So he actually thought it was a good thing. It was not. And today, 120 years later, all of humanity is just being asked one question. Do you feel lucky? And that's the issue of whether we do something or not. Now, there are some good signs. These are some, some positive things in the world. Globally, birth rates are declining. Oh, I forgot. Birth rates are declining globally, not just in a few places, primarily because of an increase in educational opportunities and economic opportunities for women. The use of alternative fuels is increasing rapidly, especially in places like Europe. Poverty is decreasing, not as much as it ought to, but it is decreasing. Generally, health is improving, and we know from people, from colleagues who are not here, well, who, some of them will be here on Thursday, but are not here right now, that fresh water is actually abundant on the planet and is going to be abundant on the planet. Unfortunately, there, there are more reasons for concern than there are reasons for optimism, and these are just some of them. And this is cause for concern. Climate change is primarily a biological problem. That's mostly because living systems have created the problem in one way or another. And it's threatening. And climate change threatens life. Now, if it's a biological problem, it means that it's an evolutionary problem. Because life is an evolutionary system. 
And everything on this planet is part of a single complicated evolutionary history. Which is another way of saying that we're all in this together. What does evolution promise us? Not a lot. It promises that there are limits to growth with severe penalties if you overgrow. It promises that there is no actual progress in life, there's just survival. And if you persist long enough, if you survive long enough, you may find novel solutions to problems that seem to be better than what you had before, but even they are not permanent. In other words, all benefits are offset by costs, and everything that happens in which it appears that the benefits outweigh the costs will be temporary. That's evolution. So what's most at risk on this planet? Not the virus. <coughs> Some of your favorite fuzzy little creatures may go extinct. The biosphere is in zero danger of going extinct unless we blow up the entire planet. And the reason for that is because evolution is a system of open-ended, indefinite variation. We have had several episodes in evolutionary history in which as much as 90% of the species on this planet have gone extinct, and there has still been enough potential left to renew and regenerate a complex biosphere. So the biosphere is going to make it. For the same reason that Lao Tzu recognized many years ago, the new beginnings are often disguised as painful endings. The old is passing away, the new is going to emerge. That's the story of evolution. And there are already indications that the biosphere is beginning to respond to climate change in the way that it always has. And one of the things that is important for us to understand is that the biosphere is not waiting for us to decide whether we're going to participate in the renewal. Homo sapiens as a species is also not in danger of going extinct. So everybody who says, ah, oh, you know, we may be gone from the planet, this is not true. And the reason for that is because human beings are everywhere doing all kinds of things. The real question is not whether or not there will be humans left 50 years from now, it will be what are they going to do? What kind of life are they going to have? Because what's actually at risk from climate change is technological humanity. That's what's actually vulnerable. <coughs> that can't be true. How could that possibly be true? There, there's no way in the world that all of this stuff that we've made over the last 12,000 years is actually making us more vulnerable because it's been designed to keep us from being vulnerable. Well, in fact, here's what evolutionary history tells us. For the last 500 million years, this is an encapsulation of evolutionary history. When the conditions change, you run away. If you can't run away, you try to cope. And if you can't cope, you go extinct. That's evolutionary history in a nutshell. And human history has been exactly the same. For most of human history, <coughs> whenever we were faced with changing climatic conditions, we moved. If it stopped raining, we moved to some place where there was water. If it got too cold, we moved to some place where it was warm. Or we died. Past civilizations have experienced climate change events in the last 12,000 years. So human civilization, that is sedentary humans, domestication, agriculture, urbanization, all of that is only 12,000 years old. And during that time, we have experienced relatively minor climate change events, but they've been enough to destroy civilizations. Every civilization that has experienced a climate change event in the last 12,000 years has been destroyed. And that's why they're more abandoned than occupied cities on this planet. And that's because cities limit our ability 
to run away from climate change, to escape. That's how our technology has trapped us. And that's the challenge. That's what's left us vulnerable to what's happening now. This, for example, is an, a sunrise shot at Angkor Wat. This is a city, a huge, enormous urban complex, highly technologically advanced, killed by climate change, killed mostly by an inability to cope with climate change. So there are no skeletons here. There are no dead people at Angkor Wat. The people who live there tried for 30 or 40 years to cope with climate change <coughs> fluctuations, and then finally they said, we can't handle this. They moved 300 kilometers away, and their ancestors are still alive throughout Cambodia. They're called the Khmer. But Angkor Wat, the Angkor complex, never returned. <coughs> Here are some of the ways in which cities are unusually vulnerable to elements of climate change, including my particular specialty, which is emerging diseases. And mostly, it has to do with the fact that cities can only survive if they're hyper-connected and if they have high-density population. <coughs> that maintain an enormous complexity of technological interactions. And this is a double-edged sword. It's a cost and it's a benefit. And this is, this is what my colleagues and I call the transfer sy syndrome. If any of you have ever read the Foundation's uh, trilogy by Isaac Asimov, you know what that refers to. If you haven't, read them, because this is going to partly inform what will be happening in the next 30 years in your lives. And this is what we refer to as the perfect storm. We have constructed a largely technological niche for ourselves within which we are living beyond our means. So we're spending more than we have in the bank. And it's nobody's fault, but all of us are to blame. And here's another inconvenient truth. This was the summary of, of uh, a, a conference in Singapore a year and a half ago where, where a number of us, including myself and Sean Cleary, spoke. At the end of the conference, the organizer got up and he said, I invited 12 speakers. None of you knew each other before this conference. I didn't invite a message. I invited people to speak on individual topics. None of you knew each other. You all came here, and in two days, you all said exactly the same thing. And this is the summary. The time is short. The danger is great. We are unprepared. Even countries that say that they believe in climate change and are very proud of that are doing nothing. If France believed in climate change, for example, Paris would not have flooded this spring. Talk is cheap. Every country on this planet is talking. Nobody's doing anything. But we can actually change this if we decide to do it. And that's why I'm happy to see this age group here. Because it's not fair. But my generation discovered the problem. Your generation has to take care of it. And it's not fair, but it's true. And we have been really really wrong. We've actually done a bunch of good things in the past that should have been seen as buying us time to cope with climate change, but we wasted all of that by believing that what we were doing was stopping climate change and reversing climate change and other delusions like that. What we need to do is to understand that we can't reverse this process. But we can anticipate that's what, what is coming at us. And we can use that knowledge to cope with what's coming at us. For example, by 2050, 70% of human beings will live in cities. Now, I've just finished telling you that big urbanized centers are at risk. And we're trapping ourselves more and more and more in cities. In November, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Spanish influenza pandemic. 
which infected 25% of human beings on this planet and killed 10% of humanity in a year. There are now 4.6 times more people in cities than there were then. And influenza is a pathogen that is transmitted by direct <coughs> contact, which means the more highly densely packed humans are, the more pronounced the disease outbreak will be. The most limited factor we have is, is not oil or water or energy or anything like that, it's time. What we have the least of that we need the most of right now is time. We need to buy time. <clears throat> Because we need your generation and your children's generation to have enough time to use your creativity to figure out how to survive this mess. We have to buy time to cope with what's coming at us. Because we can't stop it, we can't reverse it. And at this point, we probably cannot even slow it down. And it's not only that climate change is occurring, we're into to what people call a second order world, where the rate of climate change is increasing. So not only is it happening, it's happening faster and faster and faster all the time. Anticipate to mitigate is the hopeful metaphor for the future. Accept what's coming, understand what's coming at us, use the knowledge of what's coming at us to try to cope with the future. Rather than saying, we're just going to not accept what's coming at us and we're just going to pretend that we can stop it. But you need time to figure out how to survive. We don't need heroics and we don't need whining excuses. Shandor and I both participated in an event in, in Budapest a month ago where a retired American Army General who had been the head of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers spent a lot of time whining to us about how the disaster in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina wasn't really his fault, even though he was in charge of the organization that failed to protect the people in the city. We don't need that kind of whining anymore. Like I said, nobody's fault, but everybody's to blame. Own it, move on, do something positive. And here are a couple of pictures that I took in New Orleans, in the lower, what's called the Lower Ninth Ward, after Hurricane Katrina. Now it turns out that cooperation is the real key to this. And as Jody pointed out on Sunday, human beings actually have this amazing ability to cooperate. Okay. It stems from the fact that we're social primates. But we actually have an even greater ability to cooperate if we want to. So this common ground, common ground was a spontaneous community phenomenon in the Lower Ninth Ward in, in New Orleans. This is the, 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 the place that was damaged the most by, by Hurricane Katrina. This is where the levees failed. Mostly black people, poor people. Nobody cared. And even though this is an area that was almost devastating, it's made of, of poor people, everybody there got together. There was one house, this house, which was still standing, everybody brought whatever they had, tools, bottled water, food, anything they could salvage, came to this house and they said, if you need it, come and get it. If you need a tool, come and use the tool, bring it back. And it all worked. Human beings, that's a very local kind of cooperation, but human beings even cooperate well on the intermediate levels. These kids, are university students from Ohio, from a university in Ohio called Bowling Green University, who quit school for a semester to come to New Orleans to help. So we have it within us to do the right thing. And this kind of attitude in the hands of people who have advanced training can be very powerful if it's given a chance. So here's the biggest problem we actually face, is that if we're going to survive this with technological humanity intact, if we're going to have a world in which your grandchildren 
use the internet instead of asking you what kind of fish you catch with an internet, then we have to help our neighbors, especially ones that we don't like very much. That's going to be the most difficult thing to do, is to understand that I may not like this person, but my own survival and my children, my grandchildren's survival depends on working with them because we cannot defeat a common foe if we're at war with ourselves. And you're all going to be really tired at the end of this. But there are serious projections now that suggest that by 2050, 50% 50 of humanity will be gone. You don't have to worry about overpopulation by 2100 because Half of the people in this room and all of your family will be gone in 30 years if we don't do anything. So you're going to be more than just tired, you're going to be dead. It's not going to be cheap and it's not going to be easy and it's not a temporary program. This is not a five year program of investment by government or the UN or anything. This is a permanent change in the way we do business with each other, the way we operate. It's possible, and it may be essential if we want to maintain things like running water and electricity and the internet into the future. Because very soon, within the next five years, there are only going to be two places, two kinds of places on this planet. Places that people are running away from, and places that people are running to. And your choice is going to be to decide whether you're going to be part of this process or not. And 50 years ago, when I was finishing my next to last year of high school, I was in the summer before my last year of high school, a book called Soul on Ice was published by Eldridge Cleaver. And in that book, he said this 50 years ago. You're either going to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. Or, as chemists often say, you're either part of the solution or you're part of the precipitate. So the question is, where are you going and what are you going to do? Now to follow this up, what I'd like to do is, is to suggest that any of you who want to, to talk some more about this, self-organize, figure out a time and place, say on Sunday, let me know, I will show up, we will talk. Okay, thank you.